Hi everyone, with me today is uh, Philippe uh, Gonsalves, head of DeFi at Anchor, a provider of um, multi-chain toolkit to access uh, blockchain infrastructure, earn yields and integrate DeFi solution. Welcome, Philip. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, the first question is um, about Anchor, about what Anchor is doing. Can you briefly explain this for uh, those who are not really familiar with your product? Yeah, sure. So uh, Anchor is a decentralized Web3 infrastructure provider and it has like two main uh, pillars, right? The first pillar is for builders. So we offer uh, blockchain APIs and on the other side, we have the earn part where we offer liquid staking. So for, from our perspective, liquid staking is also an optimal uh, staking infrastructure that can be not only used for uh, DeFi to earn more yield and is more capital efficient than regular delegate stake, but it's also something that is easier for uh, our partners and integrators to integrate and then enable uh, staking deposits, for example, collateralized by liquid staking. So there is also an infrastructure angle uh, that is important in our liquid staking offering and that's why we're offering it. Uh, you mentioned uh, Web3 already and uh, uh, Anchor's website says that you are paving the way to the open internet of the future. Could you talk a little bit more about Web3? basically give you a vision of Web3? Yeah, sure. So I, I think Web3 is, uh, mm -hmm. is a very important financial infrastructure layer. Uh, and what we see in the, like in the traditional finance, right, is that the, the traditional financial infrastructure is very inefficient, right? And Web3 really offers uh, to have that permission and permissionless access to to that uh, financial infrastructure that is much more efficient, permissionless, easy to access, and most importantly, allows anyone to build on top of it, right? So uh, uh, we see a lot of innovation, obviously, thanks to those very low barriers to entry, because traditional finance, I mean, because of regulation uh, and other uh, aspects, it has very high barriers to entry. So now with Web3 is really that wonderful opportunity, barriers to entry are very low, anyone can build on top of it, there is innovation. Uh, and uh, we are basically recreating uh, financial functions from the traditional finance and every dApps on, on those Web3 applications, uh, they, they try to do very interesting use cases, right? Like uh, exchanges, obviously, lending, uh, invoicing. And uh, on our perspective, our focus is really to make sure that the builders can work in the most efficient way as possible uh, using our bl blockchain APIs. And uh, there is that different uh, decentralized angle, which is important to make sure that uh, we're not centralizing decentralized information, which is what most blockchain APIs are doing. Uh, we are decentralizing it, and we have a, a network actually of RPC nodes uh, that you can connect from. And, and uh, we're not running uh, most of those nodes, so it's uh, run by other uh, node providers. And uh, what we want to do is then to enable enhance APIs that will be built on top of those decentralized RPC nodes, uh, which is uh, the decentralization angle that maybe is not always mentioned too much uh, for the sake of building very efficiently, very fast to innovate and to be competitive. But, but I think it's really important to have that uh, infrastructure layer that is reliable and decentralized. You've just uh, mentioned that uh, the traditional financial system is inefficient. Can we just take a step back and talk about those inefficiencies which uh, are solved uh, by using uh, decentralized finance? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think th there is, uh, wh when we talk about scalability, uh, it, it's also important to discuss about transaction finality, right? So in traditional finance, you might have the feeling that uh, actually transactions are very fast, very scalable, and you can do it very quickly, but the transaction finality actually takes multiple days, right? If you do a security transfer in traditional finance and you want to transfer, transfer your Apple shares from one bank to another, that will take you about three days. And there is a lot of manual work actually involved in, into it. Uh, but with blockchain, that transaction finality is much, much smaller, right? So obviously there is still some scalable uh, solutions that can be enabled so that 
uh, we, we can perform transactions and have kind of a confirmation uh, a little bit faster, but the finality in itself is uh, uncomparably faster than in traditional finance. Oh, certainly decentralized uh, finance has huge potential, but uh, still, um, uh, if we talk about adoption of uh, DeFi tools, do you think this process of adoption is slow or just about right? And what uh, could be done to actually speed it up? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. I think the, the pace of innovation is already pretty fast in, in DeFi, right? So uh, I can experience, right, that uh, we, we have very committed teams to, to build stuff as, as much as possible and our competitors as well. Um, I think the pace of innovation is, is probably uh, about right, uh, but to speed up innovation, I think a little bit more support uh, from Web2 companies, right, when the regulatory framework maybe is a little bit less uh, uncertain. Uh, we will see, I, I think, more uh, adoption for DeFi, but it doesn't necessarily need to be direct uh, uh, adoption. It can also be indirect uh, adoption, meaning that it is also important to consider bringing DeFi solutions into centralized crypto providers that are more uh, in a Web2 logic and bringing DeFi to Web2 companies. And it's not necessarily making Web2 users coming to Web3, right? So I, I think it's a two-way street that we should not forget. I just mentioned regulation. What uh, could you share your thoughts on how crypto regulation should uh, work? So I think it's important first that obviously regulators uh, understand what is being built in in, uh, in Web three. Um, I think some some of the aspects like of investor protection uh and uh, those concerns that regulation tries to tackle in, in web3 and, and with the time uh maybe it changed a little bit so for instance i had very insightful for conversation with uh some uh people in, in dubai um yesterday and uh we, we discussed about turkey for example that actually has more uh crypto investors than uh investors investing in a traditional financial market Right, so so then you know they apparently feel pretty safe, and um, they, it's actually uh, lower barriers to entry for them to interact with with Web three directly and with uh, with that uh, market. So uh, I think there is an assessment to be made if uh, the investor protection is still really uh, a relevant topic. Should it be uh, as extensive as it currently is for traditional finance? Maybe we should reduce a little bit that requirement since people are actually willing right, to participate in financial markets. And uh, obviously we need to account that in some parts of the world, in the US, there is a very high participation in traditional financial market from the population, because there is probably more financial literacy. And in emerging markets, we actually see the opposite, that there is a very high participation in the crypto market when compared to traditional finance, right? So I think those aspects, they probably need to be uh, considered. And uh, in, in for builders in, in Web3, Obviously, when you are an exchange, uh, there is a, a lot of similarities with uh, traditional exchanges. So here probably will be subject to more regulation, but for other innovative tools uh, or dApps in DeFi, uh, probably it will be very uh, safe to try to be as decentralized as possible. And if you build a decentralized solution that is mostly automated and maintained by decentralized participants that are located in different places over the world, well, then it, it is probably going to push the regulatory uh, pressure on those participants rather than on the DAP itself, right? So I, I think that's also uh, something that uh, is uh, worth considering. And uh, well, in the case of validators or node providers, so it probably makes sense, right, to uh, consider regulating them instead of regulating the dApps that are very decentralized, right? So there is a lot of uh, conversation that will have to, be to happen with regulators to make sure that they fully understand the product architecture of those solutions. A and then hopefully, well, there will be uh, adapted regulatory frameworks uh, for uh, DeFi that actually will meet the demand and the needs of the, the users in DeFi. Now I have a more general question about the crypto. And DeFi space. 
uh, the world's economy is not in a really good shape now because of the war in Ukraine and uh, um, because of other reasons. Uh, do you think uh, there are new opportunities uh, for DeFi projects in these circumstances or are there more problems uh, than uh, opportunities? I think the geopolitical tensions lately uh, raises the question about uh, the predominance of using, for example, US dollar, right, and Western traditional financial markets uh, to have the economy running and to do in international trade using US dollar. I, I think now having something neutral, like a neutral currency such as Bitcoin, for example, is becoming a topic, right, for international trade. Is, does, does it make sense now to, to trade, uh, you know, oil or gas? Uh, using uh, Bitcoin, right? It's becoming a topic. Obviously, trading, uh, let, let's say, uh, let's say Russian ruble and and yuan for for gas. It's like two two uh, currencies that always had a lot of friction in traditional financial markets to to trade. It's very difficult to trade because they have currency control and stuff like that. Uh, so, physical gold is not very easy to trade, right? Uh, and and Bitcoin, it actually is bringing some attention now that you know, it's very frictionless and it, it's a neutral currency and now that you have all these tensions, uh, having something neutral probably is uh, something that uh, brings a lot uh, more attention and uh, it's something that maybe the world is considering a little bit more a and maybe one year ago when th there were less tensions, uh, people were not really thinking about that, right? Like do you want to train in my currency or in your currency? Uh, now it's becoming a topic, and um, I think that's good for for DeFi in general, right? Because it is uh, well politically neutral, right? Uh, ultimately, what we're building is aimed to be f as automated as possible and decentralized as possible. So, um, so I, I think that's um, an interesting involvement for for the DeFi space uh, that is happening right now. What is your take on anonymity in crypto? Do you think uh, users uh, should uh, remain, should uh, have a chance uh, to remain anonymous and not uh, disclose their identities? I think it's a very interesting paradigm that we have is in Web2, yeah. everything is private and, and companies, tech companies, they want to pay for having uh, access to information, right? They're offering tools for free for the sake of having data, right, that they want to monetize. And with Web3, it's actually the other way around. Having public access to data is the norm. And actually, you will want to pay for privacy, right? So it's a paradigm shift that is happening. Well, not sure if you know one or the other is better or not, but, but I think now we will be in a situation where public data is the norm. And well, if you want to buy for privacy, well, why not? Right, but but in, in Web two, it's very interesting that the norm is privacy, and you want to buy information, right? You have the insights. So I think that will be very interesting developments, and to see then how other companies will adapt to that kind of situation. Mm. Uh, when it uh, comes to DeFi, interchain communication is an important issue. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how far are we from having? Uh, really efficient uh, interchain communication. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I think it's important to remember, like first of all, DeFi is very new and multi-chain in itself is also even newer, right? Uh, so I, I think there is still uh, many projects that started without having the uh, that reality that multi-chain is a thing. A and now in 2022, we are in a situation where multi-chain is becoming the norm and uh, we're building tools to make that multi-chain uh, reality a uh, very seamless experience, right? Uh, one inch is a good example, it's on multiple chains, so the next step is really to make sure how can we make that experience as seamless as possible so that you don't even notice that you're necessarily on one chain or another. So uh, I think we're very close to, to make uh, well, that reality possible and interchain communication will be a requirement to, to really enhance that user experience, which is what we all want, right, to uh, bring more uh, people interacting in DeFi. And uh, finally, can we try to look into the future of DeFi? 
can we expect uh, any new DeFi tools or entire areas uh, to emerge, uh, uh, I don't know, over the next uh, few months uh, or uh, half a year, a year? So I think, well, it's difficult to be very specific about the new uh, products, but I think there will be two main focuses for this year. I think one focus is definitely on multi-chain, making it as seamless as possible experience. Uh, and, and that's what we're trying to do, for example, with Anchor and Liquid Staking, right? We're now working on enabling a cross-chain staking experience so that ultimately you can stake, uh, for example, BNB on Phantom and uh, you get BNB Liquid Staking on Phantom or any network. So we already built a bridge uh, and, and now the next step is to work on that experience to make it uh, much better. And I think the, the second point is on the capital efficiency as well, right? So ultimately one of the big advantages of DeFi is having the ability to earn several streams of passive income uh, and accumulate them and not having to choose between staking and uh, yield farming, right? So liquid staking is also solving that capital inefficiency where you can actually uh, stake, but then you can also reuse the value of stake tokens to earn several streams of income. And then ultimately, uh, the, the vision is to be able to earn staking rewards, trading fees, lending interest, accumulate all of those. A and that is bringing really that capital efficiency that is very much uh, needed in my opinion. And uh, there are many projects working on that from different angles. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thought, Philip. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting me. <laughs>